Thank you all for coming, uh, for, for coming here tonight to hear me yammer on, uh, about some fishing. Um, so yeah, so I finished my uh, PhD at University of Florida and I recently actually got hired by UF, so I'm now the new official anthropology librarian. Um, so taking me far afield from my, my days harvesting fishes <laughs> out of the coast. Um, so yeah, so um, just before we get started, uh, how many, ooh, is this clicker on? Yes, it's on the side. How about now? <laughs> um, so how many people out here are avid fisher folk? Who likes to go out every now and again? All right, we got a couple. Anybody who fishes for the predominant portion of their diet? Not too many folks. Um, well, if you are a fisher person, you know there's a lot of different ways to catch fish. Um, and the archaeological past, this is no different from today. So um, what I'm going to be talking about today is, is of course, my dissertation field work. Um, so I started at UF in 2012, and I just recently finished. So I spent about seven years um, out on the, the Florida Gulf Coast, but up farther north, so in the Cedar Key region. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. It's the approach to, to reconstructing the archaeological record of fishing in that particular area. So um, I broke my talk into to four different parts. So essentially, first I'm going to be defining ethnoarchaeology, so exactly what that is. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about my, my particular research questions, how I got into this to begin with, um, being a land lover from the uh, western shores of Lake Ontario. <laughs> um, and then uh, specifically how I applied ethnoarchaeology to fishing in Florida. And then, of course, the good stuff, what I actually found out by doing all this stuff. So first and foremost, ethnoarchaeology is uh, the use of ethnographic methods which we get from culture anthropology and a number of other social disciplines, to understand the interaction between people and artifacts, so people and things, right? It can also be people and animals, people in the environment. So it's a way that we study present people to understand past actions, right? Because the archaeological record, well, it's pretty silent. It's not going to actively get up and start showing us what happened to make all these cool tools and artifacts that we find. So we'll actually go and observe present-day practices to understand better how the archaeological record was created. So in my approach to ethnoarchaeology, I use a tripartite scheme. So I use three different sources of ethno, um, uh, ethno-historic, ethno-ethnographic uh, methods to, to create my approach to ethnoarchaeology on the Florida Gulf Coast. Not everybody can do this, it really depends on what sort of information that you have um, you know, uh, accessible, I guess, for your particular research. So I focused on the ethno-history of the region. I'm going to define all of these things. Um, I also focused on experimental archaeology. And I also did ethnographic field work with uh, present-day peoples on the Gulf Coast uh, as well. So before I get into my ethnographic field methods, I just want to set the stage, essentially, for the archaeological questions that I was asking. So um, as they, they pointed out in the introduction, I, I did focus on the woodland period um, for my dissertation. So for those of you who love Florida archaeology, you know that people have been living here in Florida for about 14,000 years. Uh, back then when Florida was uh, inhabited, if today it's a single wide, about 14,000 years it was a double wide, right? So Florida was a lot <laughs> wider back then. Um, but as the sea level began to rise, um, people started um, you know, accessing more of these beautiful rivers and the, uh, the springs that we have here in Florida. But it wasn't until about 5,000 years ago during the Archaic period um, that our shoreline in Florida actually established itself. And we see that beautiful salt marsh that's so iconic of the, of the Gulf Coast actually started to form. So um, oysters and clams and, and all the different uh, terrestrial fauna and avian fauna that flock to these places as well, right? So these beautiful, rich environments. So by the woodland period, when I started studying this stuff, um, it was a happening place, right? So everybody's out there taking advantage of the rich ecological zone that is the salt marsh. Um, there was not a moment in the history of, of the Gulf Coast after this point that people were ever wondering where their next meal was coming from. Um, anybody who's ever been on the Gulf Coast, I mean, they're between the birds, the terrestrial fauna, the fish is there, you were not going to starve. So really, this was a very thriving place, just as it is today. Um, there are sites along the Gulf Course that were akin to New York City with the, the populations that were living um, you know, in these, these sites back in the day, um, back before European uh, colonization. So we're entering in the woodland period. Um, 
early woodland settlements um, starting about 1,000 BC, so 3,000 years ago. These settlements were small, um, so this is a snapshot here. You can see the, the inset study area being around Cedar Key. So that's just south of where the Suwannee River flows out into the Gulf. He's got a little bit of um, fresh water to help um, that, that salt marsh environment thrive. So down here in Cedar Key, you see these black dots. So there's just sites all over the place. You can't throw a shell, well, you, certainly not a stone because there's not too many of those here in Florida. Um, you can't throw a shell then without hitting an archeological site. The settlements are pretty dispersed. Um, they're living in, in uh, smaller groups. Um, they're probably traveling seasonally. Um, they, we, during this time, we see uh, small villages and then maybe a small burial mound that goes along with that village. Moving a little bit farther forward in time, though, during the Middle Woodland era, we start to see what we call the fluorescence of these civic ceremonial centers. Um, what I mean by that, that big long term, is just that these um, large centers, they weren't um, unoccupied, they were occupied year-round, um, most likely. We, we have seasonality evidence telling us that they, people were living there year-round. But during certain times of the year, um, their population could have doubled, tripled even in size, as people came from far and wide to get together um, annually, sub-annually, maybe every couple of uh, decades even, for large gatherings. We know this from the material culture that's found at some of these sites. So um, material culture that's coming from you know, the panhandle of Florida. We find uh, pottery with this micaceous paste um, that's certainly coming from uh, you know, clay sources that are closer to the, the Tallahassee area, where you still get those red clays. Um, we're finding um, stone uh, and lithic material that's absolutely coming from the Appalachians. We're finding uh, copper objects that are, that are coming from the, the coppers being sourced out of the Great Lakes region. So, um, you know, again, this is not an, these are not isolated communities by any means. Um, they've got family up north. This is, you know, you've got snowbirds essentially coming down to Florida and being buried here during this time. Um, these civic ceremonial centers, uh, they take off and they're, um, we're finding more and more actually as we're doing more work. It's interesting. So this, this green highlight here is what we call the the nature coast, right? The Big Bend area. But there's actually very little natural about it. It's actually anthropogenic, right? So this is a human-made landscape. Uh, many of the islands that are dotting this Big Bend coastal area are there only because humans have been um, harvesting shell and building shell mids and creating these big centers, um, which have prevented some of these islands from eroding with rising seas over the years. So a very active environment. Um, there's not anything really supernatural about it, oh, maybe supernatural. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, so we get into the late woodland, and uh, this is the time where really civic ceremonial centers start to break apart a little bit, and towards the end of this, this period, um, at around 700 AD, so still way before Europeans got here, um, the civic ceremonial centers of Florida Gulf Coast and up into the interior, so this is a phenomenon that we see up into um, South Georgia as well, um, even as um, it, into Tennessee and the Carolinas a little bit, uh, they start to waver. Um, their uh, communities, the, the uh, sites are being abandoned. Some of them, in, in part, are being reused in different ways, so maybe they're just coming back to bury their dead there. But we can tell that people are no longer living in these places. So something happened. So throughout the middle woodland, um, sorry, throughout the woodland period, we see a lot of changes, early to middle to late, political changes, cultural changes, um, you know, the way that they're settling together, the way they're living together, the artifacts that they're creating, all change. However, there's been this narrative that what they're eating has always stayed the same, right? They're fisher coastal hunter-gatherers, and, and they just eat a whole bunch of fish, so what's, what can we tell about that? Um, you know, it's not that hard to catch a fish, right? Well, there are a lot of different ways to catch a fish, as I found out. So what I wanted to ask, you know, there's this sort of theme about continuity um, in subsistence practices, you know, as, as the archaeologists like to say, which just means they were eating the same things. So with all this continuity, but there's all this change that doesn't really jive. Um, so if everything else is changing, then why are their subsistence strategies changing? Or maybe we're just not looking at the data the right way. And so um, I wanted to ask that question. Of course, it's a hard question. 
Um, all the evidence is saying, well, yeah, they're still eating red drum, they're still eating mullet. Um, but I thought I could find a little bit more out to the story. So I decided to use ethnoarchaeology to help me piece that together, help me ask that question. So why is ethnoarchaeology um, the proper method for a question like this? Um, you know, I talked at the beginning, ethnoarchaeology is about studying contemporary practices. People living today, what the heck do they have to do with people lived, you know, who lived here 2,000 years ago? They're so very different. Well, we have to be careful with our comparisons, but hopefully I'll be able to convince you by the end of my talk that there's a good reason for it, and I think that it worked out pretty well. So, first and foremost, um, well, we're, our coastal sites here in Florida are filled with fishing remains. I mean, bones of plenty. Um, sometimes there's more fish bone than there is anything else in some of these minutes. Um, and usually they're very well preserved, which means if we look at these bones, we can actually, um, you know, we can study them. Uh, Zooarchaeologists are the people that study, uh, you know, hum uh, bones in the archaeological record. We can look at these fish bones and tell you exactly what kind of fish that is. Furthermore, I did a whole bunch of studies um, where I can recreate the size of that fish. So from one bone, I can tell you the species. I can tell you how big that fish was. And from the methods I created, I can tell you probably how they caught it as well. So with all these bones, we have very little fishing material culture. We're just talking about, um, about uh, preservation. We're talking about uh, wet site archaeology just before we came here this evening. On the Florida Gulf Coast, unfortunately, we don't have very good preservation when it comes to organic materials. And a lot of fishing material culture artifacts, they're going to be made out of uh, organic-based materials. So fishing line, nets, things like that, that's all going to be made from plant-based materials. Um, Floats and, and things of that nature are going to be made out of organic plant materials as well. So they're not going to withstand a couple thousand years of saltwater intrusion. Um, so really, we're looking at some negative data, but their, their negative data can also be mined. So some of the examples that we have from fishing material culture, not here in Florida necessarily, but throughout North America, um, first of all, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so spears, harpoons, leisters, these are all things that we still use today. These are not novel technologies. These are things that have been used for thousands of years. Like, look at this particularly cool one. So it has the, uh, the, the points are pointed in, so you can stab a fish from the top down. It'll grab their, um, it, the points will essentially insert in their soft under tissue, in their soft belly, and you pull that <coughs> fish right up. Um, fish hooks and fish gorges. Fish hooks, we actually do have um, somewhat in Florida, but only in riverine sites. We never find them in coastal locations, interesting enough. Um, this, does anybody here know what a fish gorge is? This is this pretty cool thing. So basically, the gorge, when you float it in the water, it'll be you know, laterally, and the fish will come and swallow it, and when you pull the line, it goes perpendicular, and it gets caught in the gills. So we actually do find occasionally something that might look like a gorge. Sometimes they're a little bit hard to discern, though, um, especially if they're made out of bone and they're semi-fragmented. You know, we find a lot of broken stuff in archaeological wow. sites, for sure. And it just adds to the fun challenge, right? Um, Cordage and netting, very rare to find. Um, we do have this awesome fragment of um, preserved net fragment from down in Key Marco that is up at the Florida Museum of Natural History in Gainesville. Um, what's really cool about this um, when I, I read about this, and Karen Walker has done a lot of, of research on this, if, um, if people are interested in the material culture of fishing. The net mesh on this piece of netting from 2000, almost 2,000 years ago, is the same size as the mesh netting that the FWC still uses today in their same nets, right? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, there just happens to be, there's a perfect kind of net mesh um, that catches fish quite effectively. So the Native Americans had found that out about 1,500 years ago, or at least uh, before the FWC had tried it. Um, we have you know, some you know, secondary evidence of netting, sometimes impressed into pottery, um, but that doesn't happen all the time either. So we don't find a lot of that netting, unfortunately. What's it got? Net, uh, net weights and sinkers. Um, we've got things that we're thinking could possibly be weights and sinkers that are related to fishing technology, but there's a lot of other reasons that you would want to have a weight. Uh, weights are used in weaving any sort of fabric. It doesn't necessarily have to be a net. Weights are used when you're doing um, landscaping, right, or when you're constructing a building and you're trying to get your posts upright. 
Um, so there's a lot of different uses for these. We can't always infer directly that they were related to fishing. Net floats. Occasionally, we will find evidence of uh, boards in the archaeological record, or even um, soft wood. Um, you know, this is again from down in Key Marco, um, where these wood slats were used as bobbers or, or net floats. Um, you can see some of the, the cordage and the netting was still attached to these things. But again, very, very rare. So this isn't going to be the answer for every archaeological site, especially if we're not finding indicators like this. Things like net shuttles, so secondary types of, uh, of tools and technology. So things that would be used to make um, fishing technology. Again, super rare, but really similar over, over thousands of years. Um, so this is, uh, these are net shuttles. Um, I've got these uh, photos from FloridaMemory.com. Excellent slate if you're, if you're interested in old fo uh, fo photos of Florida. Um, so today, uh, these are often made out of you know, a polymer, some sort of plastic material. Uh, they've made, been made out of bone, out of wood. The ones that we find archaeologically are often made out of shell, shocker. We've got a lot of that. <laughs> Net gauges. Um, so this is something that helps you when you're weaving a net. It helps you keep uniform sizes with the mesh so your net will hang properly in the water. Um, another fun little uh, fact about this. So again, we have um, here, here's a, a, a net uh, gauge made out of bone, several made out of shell. I have found them archaeologically where they match up perfectly, again, with the same net uh, mesh that the FWC is using and that people still use today. So again, that perfect size lot, thousands of years apart and totally not culturally related at all. Um, there's even evidence of things like fish traps um, and fish weirs, which I'll talk about a little bit. So uh, th these basketry traps, this is an ethnographic example from the, uh, from the north coast, of, the northwest coast of North America. And, and so is this, uh, this fish weir here. But if you go up into Georgia, like into the Etowah River, these stone weirs are still all throughout the rivers. Many of them were deconstructed when the Europeans came over because they presented um, obstacles to a lot of ships coming in uh, that were trying to transport goods. So a lot of the weirs that we might have had in the southeast have, have, have been deconstructed probably a couple hundred years ago. But down in South Florida, um, you know, so around Key Marco um, and in Pineland, they have these huge uh, fish traps and pools and ponds. So there's all kinds of fishing technology, but sometimes it's not always in the same place. So for me, um, I, wanted, I needed to get more intimately familiar with the practice of fishing if I was going to tackle this question. Um, so again, I used my tripartite scheme of ethnohistory, experiments, and ethnography to try to understand saltwater fishing on the Florida Gulf Coast from every single aspect that I could think of without actually having um, you know, a time-traveling machine ready to go back 2,000 years. So I started with ethnohistory. Um, so when the Spanish and European, uh, European explorers came over, the Spanish, the French, um, they often brought artists and writers with them to record all of their travels and their encounters with the Native Americans. So uh, we have drawings and paintings and etchings, written accounts from the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, when the Spanish and the French and the English were all coming over here and encountering different Native American groups. So I looked to a lot of these, this ethno-historic information for inspiration as to how I was going to um, you know, come up with the range of, of possible fishing techniques that could have been used to catch fish on the Florida Gulf Coast. So there's accounts, the nearest one is from Tampa Bay. Uh, there was a fish weir in Tampa Bay that was reportedly uh, would catch skates and rays just by the thousands. Um, and that was predominantly what they were they're capturing with this particular weir. And it was created from limestone, big cobbles of limestone. Probably all of this ended up as ship ballast at some point in the historic period. So you're not going to find these weirs probably anytime soon. Um, we have uh, uh, accounts from, from Jacksonville, so the St. Mary's River. Um, when the, the French were coming in, the uh, Huguenots essentially, and they're, they're recording all of their travels. Um, with the different groups that they're encountering, um, up into the Carolinas, into Virginia. Um, so a lot of these accounts. But what's interesting, and a little bit uh, difficult uh, to, uh, I guess, interpret with these accounts, is that, um, come to find out, they didn't always draw what they were seeing while they were seeing it. They would go back to Europe, think about it for a little while, and then maybe knock out a watercolor real quick. Um, so with that, 
what we'll often see is there's differences in these really similar drawings. You can tell this is probably the same scene done by two different artists. Um, one, eh, within probably a couple years of seeing this particular um, scene playing out up in Virginia, and then somebody comes on, you know, about, I think it was about 10 to 15 years later and does an etching, and decides to take some artistic license and maybe add a couple of extra critters. Um, so when you're looking at these things, you can see that they were taking some artistic license. Um, some of these uh, animals that are being drawn here, okay, you know, yes, a sea turtle, we could see that, probably some sort of hammerhead shark, a skate, uh, a ray, um, just definitely a horseshoe crab, crab. Okay, so there's some similarities. And then other times, um, I have a good one here. I am not sure if that is a dog, a raccoon, um, a uh, yeah, bobcat. Um, that's got to be an alligator, but it looks more like a you know a komodo yeah. lizard. Um, so again, some of these uh, artists and explorers are coming from all over, and they they've been to other places in the world too, and so they're sort of conflating a lot of the stuff in their head. So we've got to take all this ethnic sort of stuff with a grain of salt. So again, I, I've used it for inspiration and not really a direct analogy in any way. Um, but there is excellent stories about how they're processing these fishes, how they're catching them, that the women and children have such agility with a spear that they can just, you know, trot along the shoreline and that chuck a spear at a fish and come out with three right on one spear. Um, and again, that's, uh, so we're looking at the cultural diversity of society, you know, being able to go and catch these fishes. Um, kids actually were, were um, raised to be out on the coast and, and probably bringing in the lion's share of some of these um, fishes as they were growing up. And here you have them you know, building a dugout canoe. Um, so again, you know, besides the pictures, we have textural, sor uh, textural sources as well, um, you know, and all the different types of tools that they're using um, in their practices. So uh, nets and spears, and there's hooks, and there's basket traps. So we're, you know, it's not really that there's this one uh, stop shop, there's one way to go fishing, right? There's, there's probably different types or different ways to fish depending on the situation, right? Are you just feeding your family today or are your extended relatives going over? Are you having to feed an entire village, right? So they're faced with a lot of the challenges that we are whenever we're planning large gatherings or we're just trying to have a quiet Friday night. So in addition to the ethnohistoric record, um, again, I, there are no extant Native American groups living in the Cedar Key area today that have a direct connection to the people who lived there 2,000 years ago. So I interviewed people who are living on the Gulf Coast now. So I, I talked mostly with subsistence and, uh, fishermen who um, really was their day-to-day their -day life every day to go out and fish and sell that fish um, on market. Um, some of whom had been fishing in those waters for over 80 years. Um, I, I've met quite the cadre of fisher folk out in Cedar Key, um, and I'm very, very grateful for that for uh, allowing me to be part of the world for, for so long. Um, so I, I would observe these fishermen. Um, I would also just sit down and, and have conversations with them while they worked. Um, and then I often would start going out, and I, I would hold nets with them as well, um, and also with the FWC. So I actually got out, you know, to get my hands dirty. For years on end, um, so I did this quite often, every season, every type of weather. I've been out in lightning storms and squalls and, um, you know, had to deal with cut fuel lines and holes in nets and all sorts of different things. So, um, you know, getting that experience really gave me an appreciation for the, um, the ways that uh, fishing can be approached, the diversity of tools that are involved in it, um, the trials and tribulation. It's also like the unique ways that people approach it. Everybody's got their own sort of methods and their own way to modify their, their tools um, of the trade. So my work with the FWC um, actually allowed me to get involved with this on a more quantifiable level. So not only was I out there hauling nets with the FWC while they were capturing fish each month for their studies for the state, um, I actually got the numbers at the end of the day. So I can tell you how many fish are caught in what particular season, in what particular area, um, what fish are commonly caught with each other, um, the size of the fish and how that fluctuates throughout the year, all of those things. Um, so that really gave me a good basis to start building my own idea of how I would experiment with different fishing technologies um, was working with the scientists who were also fishing. So I didn't just work with um, fishing communities, but I was also hitting up the scientists for their methods as well. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't just stick with fishing, as it were, with, you know, with actual, um, you know, ray fin fishes. 
Um, I was with aquaculturalists who were practicing oyster aquaculture or clam aquaculture. Um, what this actually did was allow me to get a feel for the entire ecology, um, you know, from uh, the, the mollusks to the, the fish to the birds, the different plants that are out there. Um, I've worked with botanists out on, as well on the coast. Um, and again, I was doing this just to try to get a really thorough and all-encompassing picture of fishing on the coast, even if I couldn't be there 2,000 years ago. This led me to where I felt confident enough to start experimenting and catching my own fish. So I got a special activity license. And what I wanted to do was experiment with types of fishing techniques that are no longer allowed in Florida. So um, the reason why I had to go to the experiments is, well, there's three reasons. Um, again, we don't have that fishing material culture. So I don't know exactly where to start um, in a lot of ways. You know, I, I had to try maybe a little bit of everything. Um, currently, there's a ban on certain types of fishing practices. Uh, fish weirs, for instance, have been outlawed in the United States since the 1950s. Um, certain types of nets have been outlawed in Florida since the mid-1990s with the net fish ban. So, um, the, uh, the netting ban. So, a lot of the techniques that I thought Native Americans might be using from that information I got from the ethno-historic research, I couldn't even go out and see. Um, so I had to get a special license just to allow me to go out and do that and catch some fish with it. And the last reason I wanted to do experiments is because I needed to be able to quantify them, right? I needed to be able to figure out how many fish, how big fish, um, all that diversity, all those facts and figures, because that's the kind of information that I can find out in the archaeological record, right? So to compare what I'm seeing today with what I'm seeing archaeologically, I have to have some numbers that are going to correlate. So I needed to do experiments to give me hard numbers on what kinds of fish you can catch with different kinds of technology. So I started going out on the coast and building my own fish weirs. Um, I wasn't, I, I had to work with um, some of the uh, restrictions given to me by the state. I couldn't actually build fishing infrastructure. They weren't going to let me do that. Um, so I had to make it so it was semi-temporary and I had to stick by certain rules uh, within a 24-hour period. I couldn't have a weir in operation for 24 hours. Well, the tidal cycles being what they are, that sort of put a damp around things. Sometimes I would find myself out in the middle of the night um, having to go set a trap because I couldn't have it operating throughout a full you know, tidal cycle. Maria will attest to that because she's gone out with me in the middle of the night. Sometimes I'm all alone, that was silly, but thank you, Maria, for, for forcing yourself on me, essentially, not letting me go alone. Um, driving out to these islands in the middle of the night to go set my traps. And I did this for two years. Um, I often had UF students um, from field school, archaeological field school, these poor kids, man, um, they came to go dig some holes, and I had them up to their necks in Gulf waters, um, you know, dealing with fish and, and, you know, like actually counting and measuring live fish, as it were. So um, we took uh, all sorts of data from this. So salinity, uh, I was writing down the water, what, um, you know, what uh, phase the tidal cycle was in when we were capturing, how long the capture took. Um, we were using this wonderful wet lab out on Seahorse Key, which is uh, just off um, of Cedar Key at Wakey. And um, this great wet lab, uh, Maria was the director there at the time, and so we were trying not to kill as many fish as possible. I, I didn't want all of my fishes to die. So um, we were, you know, here's us, oh, there's Rose McCain right there. <laughs> um, and so, you know, taking all of these, these different facts and figures, and what I found out, and this is just from the fish weirs um, compared to seine nets, is that there actually is a difference in the types of fishes that are caught using different technologies. So um, this is one type of weir, another <laughs> type of weir. So I experimented with two. And then what I did is compared that to the FWC data. A seine net is a long net that um, can be dragged through the water and essentially you just round up the fish in a circle and then pull them up into your boat or up onto shore. So with seine nets, from the FWC, they catch mostly demersal fish, fish that swim towards the bottom of the water. But in both of my weirs, um, we got much fewer demersal fishes. So one weir in particular, the longshore weir, had mostly fish that swim up in the water column, right? These are fish that want to stay towards the top or just you know swim out in the open. They're not going to be deeper in the water. 
while the title beer, the second beer I experimented with, had like a 50-50 split. This was really inspiring after two years in the muck and the mud <laughs> and some hospital trips and broken boats, um, almost sunking boats, <laughs> um, and various you know, trials and tribulations along the way. So the data was looking really good, um, and it continued to look good. So um, the ethnographic work uh, started to give me really great insights, uh, things that I could, you know, uh, actually apply to the archaeological data. So that's when I started getting more into the archaeology. So to, to understand a little bit how I'm looking at fishing technology, um, I broke it down here between um, what I call active techniques and passive techniques. This is something that's in the fisheries biology data. This is where the anthropology comes in. This is where the people part comes in. So active techniques as a type of fishing technique where the person has to go to the fish. So between uh, the active technique can be further split down into targeted capture or mass capture. So think of uh, hook and line as being targeted capture. I'm going to go out and you know fish for some snook today. I know exactly where they are, exactly what kind of bait to use. That's the fish that I'm targeting. Um, catfish noodling, that's fun. Um, if anybody doesn't know what noodling is, basically you just stick your hand in some muddy water and try to grab a catfish. I don't even know. I can't even begin. To, I, I don't understand. Um, so, um, mass capture, however, is you're catching much more than one fish at a time, right? So this is where nets usually come in. Cast nets, that's a type of mass capture, but again, targeted. So you're going to throw a cast net over a school of fish, typically, right? So you're targeting that particular school. A passive technique is what I call the set it and forget it method of fishing. So you're setting a trap, walking away, and then come the next day to seeing you know, what ended up in there. And so this is going to give you a much more diverse array of fishes. But what, um, and here are some ex examples of, of mass capture. Now there's no targeted capture um, for passive techniques. Where the anthropology comes in is, well, if you're actively fishing, right, like you've got Maybe you have a six-pack with you, you're out on the nice water, you can spend a whole Friday, maybe you're alone, you just got you and your pole. You're not doing anything else then, okay, right? Uh, you're fishing, and that's it. That's what you're doing. The set it and forget it method, however, frees you up. You can do other things. Um, so what that, my interpretation of that, archaeologically, for, for the purposes that I'm looking into, 2,000 years ago, as societies were moving from you know, being in these broken down, smaller groups and communities, um, smaller villages, probably a, many of them you know, are, are, are kinship related, they're family units, you don't have that many mouths to feed. You can all go out and fish for a couple hours, and you'll probably have enough fish for a couple days. No big deal. However, when we start to aggregate populations into these civic ceremonial centers, we're not all going and fishing. We've got different things to do. You know, you might be in charge of the ceremony that evening. You might be in charge of making the pottery for the event. Somebody else is worried about the, the mortuary attendance. Like we have some burials that we've got to, to take care of. We've got a marriage ceremony to plan. Um, somebody just had a baby. Um, there's so many other things to do. There's people collecting plant fibers to make more fishing, um, you know, technology, right? We're diversifying. So what does the set it forget it method allow us to do? Other things. <laughs> Um, so this is why I really wanted to find out why, you know, how these people were fishing. It's important for every other thing that they're doing in their community. So it's that, that whole idea of, oh, well, you know, continuity and subsistence over time doesn't really jive anymore. There's no way they were doing the same thing over thousands of years if everything else changed. So I started to, you know, cross-compare these different types of active and um, passive capture techniques, and I found, you know, I did my literature research, and I studied this from all over the world, right? So what are the affordances? What's, what's you know, a good thing or a bad thing about one style of fishing versus another? Um, are, there, are these activities gendered? Um, they quite often are. Um, you know, how many fish can you, can you catch? Do you have to eat those fish right away? Not necessarily. With passive, te passive techniques, Quite often, it's what you call a delayed return. First of all, you gotta build the thing, right? Second of all, if there's still water in that trap, those fish can stay there, right? You don't have to have a cooler. I mean, there's no ice in Florida, right, <laughs> um, during this time. So there's a lot of affordances to, to either technology. So again, 
what type of fishing technology you use has to fit in with all of your other cultural practices as well. It's not something that can just be taken out. So I started to create models based on all this information and based on my experiments, and I started to apply them to the archaeological record. So where I did my dissertation research is a, a site called Shell Mound. It's not a very great name. Um, it was named that quite some time ago. Um, there's many shell mounds in Florida, but this is the shell mound. Um, it's got a number, so 8LV42, just to be specific. Um, so Shell Mound is up near Cedar Key, just a little bit north. And it's on the end of this awesome dune arm. So it, they started out with a little bit of high ground. Um, so down here in this graphic, you can see sort of the, the evolution, as it were, of Shell Mound. It started out as a mound on the top of a parabolic dune, but then um, in about 100 years, they built this thing out to be 20 feet high, like 95 feet um, in one length here, but 170 uh, feet in diameter altogether. You can fit a basketball stadium inside of this thing. It is ginormous. Um, the climate inside is different from being on the outside. Um, it's lovely on top. You have a commanding view of the Gulf Coast, and there's not a bug to be seen because you still get that nice coastal breeze. You go down in the middle of this thing in the summer, though, whoop, <laughs> it's a yellow fly city. Um, plus, it's a little dank and a little humid and a little damp. So the, the you know, shell mound has changed a little bit over the years. Partnered with Shell Mound is one of the most fascinating mortuary cemeteries we have in Florida. Unfortunately, it's been heavily looted, so the majority of stuff has been lost. Some of it is sitting in the Florida Museum of Natural History, so things have been donated back um, you know, over the years. If you go out there today, it looks like they've been using it as a testing site. It's just holes throughout the whole thing. It's very, very disturbing to see. Um, there's not very many skeletal remains. Those were all looted as well. But what we've been able to put together is that this mortuary facility predates Shell Mound by about 1,000 years. And then it was used for about 500 years after Shell Mound was abandoned. So Shell Mound had to be exactly here. Um, Palmetto Mound, you know, it, as being the, the precedent, the, the preceding Shell Mound itself, was the reason people were coming here. We've got people who were buried at Palmetto Mound, and again, their bones are, are at the Florida Museum of Natural History. We've been looking at their teeth and finding out that these folks aren't from around here. They're definitely snowbirds. They're coming in from places like Arkansas and Georgia and Tennessee. Um, there's some local folks there as well, but there's these long ties throughout the eastern United States when people are coming to Palmetto Mount to be buried. So I was looking at um, the time period right before Shell Mound comes up and during the time that Shell Mound was at its fluorescence, when it was basically kind of like the New York City of the Florida Gulf Coast area. So I happen in place to be. So not only was I looking at the sites before Shell Mound and while Shell Mound was being inhabited as a civic ceremonial center, I also looked at different types of deposits. So um, for those of you who have been out to archaeological sites or have seen some of these presentations before, the traditional shell um, you know, profile here, uh, beautiful straight walls, great <laughs> students that year at field school. Um, so we have a highly stratified deposit. Um, and that lowest deposit there uh, dates to about 800 BC. Um, going up through the Lake Woodland period, we're really just continuously occupying these islands. Um, so this is what we call quotidian vid, right? It's daily refuse. This is the kind of stuff, you know, you go out, you get some shells, you get a couple fish, you know, that's your trash pile. You do it again the next day, the next day, the next day. Other people are using it too. Um, it just slowly builds over time. This, however, is an image from the center or the interior edges of Shell Mound where these massive pits were dug. I mean, these things are over a meter wide, over a meter deep. Huge, huge pits. Why would you dig a big pit at a ceremonial site? Well, how much garbage do you usually have after a party? Mm -hmm. A lot, a lot. So what we're finding in these pits um, is these remnants, essentially, of a big feast. We find pottery sherds that were not beautiful pieces of pottery. This is kind of like the stuff that you would get at Target if you don't care if somebody breaks it or takes it home and you never see it again, right? <laughs> so you've got a lot of mouths to feed, so you're just going to slap that stuff together real quick, feed the masses, and when you're done, you just throw it back in the pit, right? Done. With um, these massive pits, I mean, throughout here we're finding all kinds of, of fish bones and animal bones. We know what they were eating, we know what they were 
kind of material culture they were making. So I was able to compare those different kinds of archaeological deposits as well. We even have things like net gauges, again. So I know they're fishing, right? I've got a lot of evidence, but how are you doing it? So um, I went through, I got a grant, I got some help, and we started quantifying all this stuff and adding it up. So what did I find? Three different types of variety is what I'm going to show you now. So first of all, there was change over time. That's good for us archaeologists. We like to be able to see that. So first off, I just proved that whole idea about continuity. This is not the same. We're there not doing the same thing throughout those you know, 2,000 years, 3,000 years of the woodland period. So I found out that over time, fish size decreased. So in the beginning, at the early, early sites before the civic ceremonial centers, they're getting really big fish. And then the civic ceremonial centers show up and their fish start to get a little bit smaller. Maybe they just need more fish to feed more mouths, and so they're not as picky as about you know, the size of the fishes that they're going at. We have no evidence for resource depression, meaning that there's no evidence that they're over-harvesting the fishes that they're going after, right? They're not impacting the environment negatively, they're just catching some different sized fishes. <clears throat> I also found that the trophic level decreased over time. Trophic level is a way of like sort of organizing animals, right? So um, the bigger fish, uh, let's just pretend this is a size thing, uh, bigger fish will have a higher trophic level than the smaller fish. So like smaller fish, they typically eat a lot of plants, low trophic level. Big fish eat a lot of other fish, high trophic level. Um, so trophic level was decreasing over time. So they're eating more fish that eat plants um, as well. Interesting, keep that one in mind. They're also, um, is this working? Maybe. It's green, okay. So schooling species increase over time also. So instead of targeting um, fishes that maybe are swimming solo, they're, they're targeting fishes that are all swimming together. That's where I started to think, okay, this is definitely technology related. Spatial variation, um, this is a crazy looking graph, sorry about that. Um, it's real important for my dissertation though. <laughs> um, so again, during the pre-civic ceremonial uh, center areas over here, and then this is during over here. You can see there's a color difference, a lot more gray on that side, a lot more orange on that side. Um, so, the offshore sites that I looked at, so the sites a little bit farther away from Shell Mound, but again, are from before the time that Shell Mound was occupied, more solitary species. Um, the nearshore sites, so the ones that are closer to Shell Mound, I found more schooling species. So there's a little bit of a spatial variation too, so where you were on the landscape might also have influenced what fishes that you're going for, what types of fishing technology are you using. Furthermore, I found that uh, freshwater species were only present at Shellmount. There are freshwater rivers near some of these sites, like directly next to them, and they were fishing predominantly for saltwater species. So, you know, humans, we make a lot of interesting decisions about our food. Sometimes certain things are just off the table, right? Um, some things we just don't go after, we don't eat. But I found very intriguing, and that's another paper right there, as to why freshwater species are only showing up in the pits at Shell Mound. Furthermore, um, spatially, um, the top species, the most frequent species were different depending on the location of the site. So the nearshore sites had a lot of mullet and a lot of jack, while the offshore sites had more sheepfish and more birdfish. And then, this is another crazy graph you don't have to worry too much about, except for the fact that um, the green, so the ones down here in this uh, right side of the graph, um, are prior to shell bound. Um, the purple are the, the minim components, so the daily refuse, and then the red is the ceremonial stuff. So nice grouping, so really good data results. So the features, the ceremonial signatures of this time period, the fish in them were very, very different from the, um, the places where people would just deposit daily you know, refuse, their day-to-day their -day um, you know, uh, trash from what they're, they're eating. So um, <clears throat> this predominantly showed up in the species differences. So we find that mullet are the favored fish for these gatherings. Um, mullet, uh, if anybody here has you know, had mullet, you've been to, um, you know, anybody who smokes mullet, you're not going to smoke just one mullet, right? You're not going to smoke one person with some mullet. You're 
catch a lot of mullet. Why? Because they school together. They're really easy targets when they school together. Cast netting is a great way to catch mullet. Um, so mullet, mullet are still the fish of gathering in Florida. That hasn't changed, even though um, clearly our, our demographic makeup has changed quite a lot. So that was, that was the most standout feature, I think, of, of all of this. Um, again, there's a higher trophic level um, in the middens. So again, they're probably eating more carnivorous fishes, fish that eat other fishes on a daily basis. But for the, the, uh, you know, the ceremonial functions, they're going back to these mullet. Mullet don't eat other fish. They eat plant detritus. Um, they're sort of uh, what we call detrivores. They eat a lot of the broken down plant material on the bottom. Um, of the, of the uh, water level. So overall, there's mass differences in, the, in like how they're depositing these fishes, what fishes are being approached. What we also found out is that the ceremonial pits at Shell Mound were being deposited in the summertime. And so 2,000 years ago, how do we know what season um, and actually what time of, um, what particular portion of that season, we only have real two seasons in Florida, <laughs> if you're going to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, so what time in the summer? Well, probably about June 21st, roughly. How do we know that? Um, there are bones from egrets that are juvenile birds, and they're only juveniles for a very short time. And when they're fledgling and they're about to leave the nest, it's usually about mid-June. And from those bones of those egrets, we can tell that's probably when these pits were laid down, too. Now, if anybody here knows anything about mullet, when do you catch mullet? In the fall. In the fall. In the fall. So how are all these mullet getting in these summer pit features when that's not the time to eat mullet? So here's another perplexity. These people weren't just going after the fish that were more easily available. They were actually targeting fish off season. Why are they going for mullet? Because they're gathering in the summertime. How do you get so many mullet in the summertime when they're out of season? So I couldn't really answer that for my experiments. Um, but what we could do is start looking around the area of Shell Mound. About two clicks to the south of Shell Mound is this island called Richards Island. About four or five years ago, this uh, avid kayaker gentleman may, um, named Ed Allen came up to um, Dr. Ken Sassman and I and said, there's something funny going on this island, and no one's listening to me and you've got to listen to me, I think it's a fish trap. No one believed this guy. He'd actually been turned away by geomorphologists, uh, uh, you know, these uh, uh, people who study the coastlines, biologists. No, no, no. It's got to be natural. We finally got out there with Ed Allen. We kayaked through this thing, and we tested it. And it turns out, on Richards Island, there is this large seawall of oyster shell that lines this embayment with a series of canals in tidal pools that are all connected, interconnected. Um, it's actually a tidally operated fish trap. When we put a core in um, to this, this uh, oyster wall of shell, we got some date backs, uh, dates back. Guess what time period it dates to? Shell Mound, right? The Civic Ceremonial Center era. This was a fish trap. I mean, if they can build something like shell mound, they can build a fish trap out of oyster shell, right? I mean, come on. So going through, and we have a little bit more testing to do, but there's minutes all around this fish feature, which I'm guessing is a fish trap at this point. I'm pretty, I'm like 90% confident. Um, where they were probably going here and targeting mullet off of season. How are they doing that, and why would mullet be in there off season? Well, mullet, when the water temperatures get really warm, like in the summertime, they don't like it so hot. What they do is they'll actually bed down in these karst holes in the cool mud down deeper in the water. They're actually really good at living in low oxygen environments. Mullet don't need a lot of oxygen content to live. So they can bed down in these cool little hovels <laughs> in the summertime, and you won't see them in the water, but they're there. What this trap actually does is mimic those karst holes that are so prevalent along the Gulf, Gulf Coast. The Native Americans had observed this and decided to make their own, falsely corralling those mullet into maybe a false sense of security. Um, so they could corral them, cut this little gate off. I don't think so, I can't really point, but you see number one at the top there, cutting that access point off before the tide turns and the fish are able to go out. I actually strung a net, so it's a technique called creek stopping. 
I strung a net across that entryway uh, with some undergraduate students um, over one of the summers. And within about two minutes, there were so many fish trying to get out of that trap, we had to let go. We were basically going to be pulled out into the Gulf Coast because all of these fishes, it was just like a mass exodus. So fish are still going into this trap to this day. And it was thanks to you know, an advocational kayaker. Um, he's got a, a little interest in archaeology. He thinks it's cool. But this is, it was really, he's a naturalist who came out here and noticed this, and the scientists weren't listening to him. I hate that story, but it actually does end well. We did listen to him. Thank you, Mr. Ed Allen. Um, so what we, uh, essentially, what I found out from all my studies is, okay, I was able to rule some things out. That's a good thing in science, right? You, you can at least, you know, if you can't say exactly what was happening, you can say what wasn't happening. So I ruled out the longshore weir and the tidal weir. Those are the two types of weirs that we see most often in the ethnohistoric accounts. Now let's remember the ethnohistoric accounts were taken about a thousand years after the time period I'm looking at, so no wonder they're fishing with different techniques. What I was able to find out through my experiments is that most likely they were, they were using seine nets, which is a type of net that's still used by the FWC today. It's legal in certain forms, still in Florida also. It's a super effective way to get a lot of fish in one foul swoop. You just need some friends to help you drag that thing in. I also um, validated individual capture, so even though I'm not finding things like harpoons and leisters and spears, um, maybe I'm finding bits and pieces of them, but because they're broken up, I'm not able to say for sure. Um, but through my comparative studies, they're likely using individual capture. So again, from you know, type, nice images here, so probably ruled out the types of traps that the Europeans were seeing later on. Um, again, thousands of years after, a thousand years after um, the time period I'm looking at. Um, but I could definitely see the other uh, methods. So uh, that image in the middle there is that um, uh, it's a, a drawing or a painting that was done uh, by a person who was working with the archaeologists who work in South Florida, Pineland. Um, so that's the same net. So that large staff uh, connecting uh, a net um, that's drawn across a, a little bit there. And I think most likely they were using things like big traps too about 2,000 years ago. So I was able to show through using ethnohistoric, um, ethnographic uh, methods and ethnohistoric research um, and experiments, I was able to show there is really distinct changes over time with the way that people were capturing fish on the Gulf Coast, particularly in the Cedar Key area. Um, I can't say that about all of Florida. I'd have to go to all of the sites and check them all out. Um, but certainly that's coming. I would like to definitely take this approach and try it in other places. So maybe trying it here in the Tampa Bay region, trying it down um, in Pineland in South Florida in uh, the Charlotte Harbor area. So what I was able to discern is that there actually was a big correlation with changes in fishing technology and changes in religion, changes in culture. Change, uh, large changes in technology, changes in settlement type. So just because the same species of fish are being caught doesn't mean they're fishing in the same ways. Heck, we still eat mullet today, but it doesn't mean that we're doing it the same, we're not catching them in the same way that people were catching them thousands of years ago. Not completely anyway. Um, I do like to go back to the whole, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it sort of thing. We do find a lot of commonalities in our technology in here today as what was being used thousands of years ago. Um, so I found this change between individual capture techniques to mass capture, same netting, down to specialized technology, like massive fishing infrastructure that resulted in the creation of Richards Island. So um, ethnoarchaeological approaches can be extremely insightful. I think the major takeaway from this is that not one approach is going to guarantee you um, results. You've got to use several different methods, cross-correlate those methods so they can check each other out. That's going to make your inferences stronger. Um, so it, it took me a while to do. It took me several years of experiments and um, interviews, but I think it was really worth it in the long run. We got some really great data. And we finally were able to crack a question that's been plaguing us for a long time. How are they getting all of those fish? We have all those bones, but no tools. Well, we can. We got through it. Well, we got to answer that question through the back door, I guess. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Um, I will stop there because I'm a little bit over time. Um, but I'm here in case anybody has questions or fishing stories that they'd like to tell. <laughs> Where did bow fishing start? 
Well, um, so technologically speaking, in the eastern United States, uh, so the Bowen arrow, as we know it today, came in really late. Um, so not until about 1200 AD. Um, so um, when we talk about, you know, people say, oh, I found an arrowhead. Arrowheads actually don't show up in eastern North America until very late. Arrowheads are really tiny. Um, around, uh, around this area, people will often call them bird points. So have you ever heard somebody call a bird point? An arrowhead is about that small. Um, so the larger, you know, um, our, our spearheads, projectile points, those big things, those, those are spears, and so, or knives. Um, so we see those quite um, much more often. However, you don't necessarily have to have a lithic point to have a spear. So a lot of the, um, so in the, the ethnohistoric accounts, when they're talking about um, like sort of bow fishing or spear fishing, they're talking about taking a reed and fire hardening the tip um, and, and shooting that. That's not, that hasn't, we don't have any evidence of that from the archaeological record because again, it's an organic material, it's not showing up in the majority of sites. So a little bit difficult for us to say when fishing like that might have come online, but all I do know is to say that the, the bow and arrow, how we know it with the lithic point, didn't uh, show up, it didn't actually, it wasn't invented here until pretty late in the scheme of things. Mm -hmm. So what kind of fish were those that you caught at Richard Island with your students at the creek clocking? Were they mullet? Oh yeah, yeah, so my first experiment was to just go in there with a cast net. And so I was just going out and I was uh, casting into these these different uh, pools and it was it was a springtime, so I was getting the young of the year mullet, so this little finger mullet. Um, and so I got a lot of those. I got a lot of um, things like silver sides and mulharas, so those tiny little silvery fishes that we often use as bait or are just there for, you know, other larger fish to eat, really, because we don't uh, capture a lot of those. Um, there were things like uh, leather jackets. There were, um, there were pinfish, pigfish. Um, trying to remember the exact numbers of things. And then there were, um, there were young uh, sea trout, which is actually a drum. Um, so a lot of, you know, just common, common things that we see today. But there were more mullet there than, than other species that I had seen. Um, and then for the experiments, I, I really got the full range of, of what we typically find. A lot more small fishes in the weirs overall, though, than what I was finding in the same net. So we don't find, we find a, a decent number of tiny fishes, like pinfish in archaeological record. But well, we actually have a lot of really, really big fish in these sites too. But the same sort of fishes that we're eating today. So um, red drum, black drum, sheep's head, um, uh, spotted sea trout, um, uh, Atlanta croaker, um, spot. So a lot of different things, but mostly mullet in that trap. Yes? You kind of mentioned it indirectly, but when you're talking about the size of these shell mounds with them being yeah. gigantic, what ratio would you say, how much? Shellfish were they eating in comparison to fish? That's a good question. We have to quantify that. So, um, in so we've estimated that there's about 1.2 billion oysters that comprise the shell mound. <laughs> Roughly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, but as far as numbers of fish, that's a hard one to figure out. The problem with fish and, and some other uh, animals as well is that to to get a count, um, to, so my difficulty was comparing living fishes to fish bones. Um, so there's only a certain number of bones in a fish's body that are unique, original. And that's what I needed to be able to say, this one bone equals one fish. Or sometimes they have sided bones, like you know the left operculum, which is their gill cover, versus you know the right one. So if I have 37 left operculum from a sheep's head, I know that there's at least 37 sheep's head. But sometimes you have you know a lot more vertebra, um, and you know when you're getting to vertebra from the fish, okay, you could have hundreds of vertebra. Well, I mean fish have a lot of vertebra, so you can't just do a simple divide and estimate how many fishes you have there. So it's a little bit of a dicey situation comparing um, how many fish you have to how many oysters. Because with oysters, it's, it's pretty straightforward. If you've got a hinge, that, that's one. It's a left hinge or a right hinge. Um, so it could be difficult. But the, um, the other difference is, so like the, the shell midden, you know, from the same volume of shell, you can fit a lot more shell, in, um, a lot more fish in the same volume than you can oysters. Because oysters are going to take up more space. Um, than those fish bones. So um, I think, you know, overall though, in the features, it's predominantly fish. So like out of the, the big pit features, those really dark 
you know, uh, soil stains that we were looking at, these ceremonial pet features, uh, it's about 90% fish versus maybe 5% shell and maybe 5% um, terrestrial and an avian fauna. Um, so when you, we know when they're having these large gatherings, these pits are where a lot of the fish are going, but there's probably other fish that are going into those, those shell deposits as well. So it's a little bit difficult for us to get to those numbers. Um, that, that'll be a challenge, but certainly something that we've got to quantify. Yeah? Your research is fishing, so I'm hesitant to ask you this question. Did you run across any indication of manatee bones at any of your sites? No. Um, you know, it's really interesting we don't find manatee. It's almost like they're like the, I don't know, marine puppies or something. Like no one wants to go and hunt them because they're so easy to go up and club. Um, it, it's been really interesting. Um, so you know, I've heard this from other archaeologists in, in Florida as well. You know, all of these sites, why aren't they eating manatees? Um, maybe they were and they were depositing their bones somewhere else is, is one theory, that maybe manatee bones have to go back into the water uh, or they have to go into the springs or something. That's why we're not finding them in archaeological deposits. Um, other things are taboos. Maybe it was just taboo to eat a manatee. Um, the Spanish didn't think so because they came over here and started clubbing them like you know, seals and the, the Native Americans were completely against it. The Spanish had no problem with it whatsoever. So it could have been a cultural thing. So, uh, but yeah, no manatee, but not a single one. Um, and we do find dolphin, um, found bear, um, you know, uh, panther, all sorts of things. Um, drilled panther teeth, I mean, um, you know, a whole, whole gamut of really interesting um, fauna, but no manatees. Yeah. Is there any evidence of red tide? Not that I, I know of. Um, and again, I don't know how what, that, what a red tide signature would look like well, archaeologically. The red tide itself, you're not going to find that individual. But there's a, a, a microorganism that hangs with it mm -hmm. that lasts. In the, oh, in does the it have a bone like a structure it's, or a skeletal it's got, structure? It's got a skeletal structure. Okay. Strong skeletal. Yeah. So what we so when we dig a lot of these sites, what we do is we'll take these smaller samples or we'll fine screen them. You know, we even save everything like you know that comes out in the tiniest of the screens into the good. soil samples. And so what we can do is we can go back and look at those microfauna. Um, signatures to be able to compare that. Yeah, we're actually yeah. working on a project right now where we're looking at these very small snails called Trunctella, and they apparently have a very specific niche where they live. Um, and so we can use that to sort of cross correlate the presence of Trunctella and storm surges to try to see where you know we might have you know uh, uh, extreme sea level rises and, and when maybe when you know seas have transgressed over top of middens and things like that if they have the presence of these particular tiny tiny little snails so there's not anything that we um, you know collect that we can't sort of mine for more information in one way or another so that's yeah um, looking into red tribe yeah because it would be interesting to see like how often that maybe occurred in the past before we started with uh, you know, agriculture well, things like that you, should, you know that there's a site over in Tampa, the Tampa mm -hmm. side, where they found a whole bunch of an entire group of cormorants that died out because they'd been eating red tide fish. Oh wow! And wow. well, the thing is, it's a, what's, in, what's important about it is that it's significant that we have a record of red tide yeah. that's that old. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's not yeah. something recent. Right, right. Yeah. And, so, and in the, the northeast, you had people that told the colonists not to fish at a certain time of year because of a red tide like organism. Right. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so there's there's no doubt that, that uh, red tide instances happen in the mm -hmm. past as well. Even yeah. since none yeah. of these phenomena would, are, are It unique. would have been significant. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to walk along the shore at Maximum Park, and I always felt that when we were, when you'd see a lot of deer boat laying out there. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah. They're not they, fishing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. Oh. Is there any evidence that they ever salted the fish so that they didn't have to eat it very quickly after catching it? So um, in my dissertation, I actually I, I try to follow that train a little bit, too, because um, what we've also been trying to understand is the relationship between people on the coast and people on the interior. So especially people who are coming to these gatherings, are they all coastal folk? Or are they coming from Gainesville? Or you know, are they coming from interior Georgia? I mean, we're, are we looking at a you know wide distribution of people and people who maybe didn't fish at all? And so um, you know, people were coming down and they're used to very different practices. So why mullet exactly? Well, it's off season first of all, so it must have meant something else besides just the the 
you know, being the most abundant fish, because they weren't the most abundant fish at that time of year. But what, what connects the coast to the interior are mullet, because they come in from the, the salt water and they go up into the, the freshwater rivers and they go into the springs. So mullet might have been a, a, a social thread that connected people on the interior and people on the coast. Um, where mullet had to be caught because that was the symbolic connection between these right. different groups of people. Yeah. Um, so um, it certainly could be um, it, that there's those those connections also where there um, it, mullet is not just a, a fish that could feed a lot of folks because they they all flock together they come in schools but they had a deeper connection to these people and connected these groups um, that were that were coming in from different spots. So that's going to be something that. I want to look into because it could be that mullet were being processed there and salted and then they could be party favors. They're also taking food <laughs> with them back home because that's another thing if you've gone to a seafood fest, you, know, you, you pick up the smoked mullet, that stuff can last in, you know, on your counter for days, let alone you don't even have to put it in your refrigerator. Um, you know, and it can be turned into so many other things. So um, there are, uh, there have been awesome studies done, which I'm sure you know about um, salt in, um, in pottery shirts, right? So we can see if they're processing salt. There are these ma massive salt kettles um, that are left over in Cedar Key from the historic era. So um, we know that they're processing, um, you know, seawater for sea salt um, in the historic era as well because they were salting fish here in, you know, on the Florida Gulf Coast and shipping that stuff all the way up to New York in the 1800s. Um, you know, salt's a pretty basic technology. So I want to be able to look into more studies to see if I can find evidence of salting. Um, you know, if we can't differentiate between things like smoking and cooking, maybe we can see other preservation techniques um, for, for sure, because mullet are excellent for preser preserving. I mean, more, more so than any other fish, because they have such a wonderful flesh. Yeah. Um, your choice to go to Cedar Key, was it because it was more accessible um, versus Say, for example, we have um, the hospital Bayfront, where it used to be called Mound Park because of the mounds of shells. Is that any kind of relationship to what you found in Cedar Key? Or um, yeah, so, so I, I'm, not, I'm not too familiar on the local archaeology here. The, the reason I actually ended up in Cedar Key um, so I, when I was looking for graduate schools to come, so I, I, I came here from New York and I had been working on the Georgia coast for years before I started uh, working in Florida as an archaeologist. Um, I was shopping around for, for PhD programs and Irv Quitmeyer from the Florida Museum of National History, which I've known for years from working with him on the Georgia coast, um, took me out to Cedar Key for lunch. <laughs> and then when I ended up coming to the University of Florida, my very first semester, I took a class in ethnoarchaeology. And so I needed a project, and this is how my dissertation project was born. I actually came to UF to study something very different. I was going to be studying um, what we call the missing millennium. There's actually like a time period in the archaeological past in the southeast where we find that we have very few radiocarbon dates, and we sort of correlate radiocarbon dates to the presence of people. So if, we don't have, if we're lacking radiocarbon dates from a certain time period, where do the people go? Because we need fire to live, right? So, um, so I was going to work on the missing millennium. But then I took this awesome class on ethnoarchaeology, and I was like, well, you know, we've always been struggling with this problem of where's the fishing gear? And so maybe I'll learn more about fishing gear, and I'll go to that sweet town that Irv showed me. <laughs> and boom, all of a sudden, next thing you know, I'm seven years later, I'm still out there. Yeah. Did you find any, like, lures? Yeah, so, no, we, we don't find, actually, I found a lot of lures while I was processing fish, so I actually had to sacrifice uh, 352 fishes in my study, because I had to macerate a lot of fish to get to the fish bones after I measured them to come up with these equations so I can infer fish size. So I found a lot of lures and fishes that I was <laughs> processing, um, you know, like I would get the nice hook and the little red feathers and everything, um, but no. So um, again, I found little to no evidence in our archaeological excavations, not just the ones that I worked on for my dissertation, but the other sites that I used for my dissertation that I wasn't physically there to, to excavate, found nothing that looked like a lure, found nothing that looked like a hook. So no evidence of that targeted fishing technique, except for the type of fish that were being caught. Um, we do, however, find um, so gastropods, marine um, gastropods, so crown conchs, lightning whelks, things like that. That interior spiral uh, called the columella, 
quite often we find those have been worked down. So like the, the both ends will be sharpened and that's probably a, a tool of some sort, whether they're using it as one of those uh, fish gauges. So uh, yeah, okay. those things that I, I talked about early on, um, you know, that's an individual technology. So these guys right here. So we find a lot of columella that have, you know, perforation, uh, that have points on either side. And then it's not really clear whether something was tied in the middle. So no smoking gun, you know, as it were. Uh, nothing that really screams hook and line, especially not on the coast. What we find from riverine sites are um, a lot of these, like uh, what we call composite fish hooks. Um, so we do find that they're using hooks in river settings. And these are probably um, like uh, trot lines, where they're setting several hooks on one line and just setting them in the water, walking away, and, and letting the fish sort of hook themselves as they're passing by. Um, so again, these are, these are prevalent. We find things called bone pins on the coast, so like we might find a, a pin, this isn't working, um, like that one part, the lower part of that hook there, of the composite hook. Um, but again, without you know it actually being connected, and there, there's a lot of different reasons, there's not a lot of different uses for, for that particular shape of bone. So no, no lures, no smoking guns. Sort of frustrating, but also insightful. Like, so maybe hook and line just wasn't the way to fish on the coast. Um, you know, it's really interesting to the net fishermen that I talked to um, on the Gulf Coast today. They'll go, you know, hook and line fishing when their buddies want to, or like they have relatives coming in from out of town. But they sort of like look at it like, eh, that's, that's for tourists. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's, there's. I spend what the past thirty years diving in the rivers in Florida. Awesome. And yeah. Tons of bone fish hooks, the bone gag hooks, and bone lures that just have a hole in them, and okay. you just pull them on a string, and then they would spear the fish, so it didn't have a hook at the end of it. Yeah, okay. So that's where they were, and they're just something for them to wave. It was yeah. yeah, it was shiny. You know, it would pull through and, and look like a minnow, I guess, or whatever. And I've heard about uh, fishermen going out with things like that, where they're just like tap, tap, tap the water, and the fish will bite, and they'll just pop them right into their boat, and there's no hook on them at all. The fish will just drop when it's flying through the air right into the boat. Um, so many fun ways. Again, lots of different ways to catch fish. Yes, yeah. I did a lot of wave fishing, and we did have a stringer, mm -hmm. and we put the fish in that way caught. Okay. Maybe some of this could be could we stringer. stringer. Yeah, yeah. So uh, again, without you know. There's, there's so many, uh, it's what we call the, the problem of, of equifinality, meaning that there's so many different ways that something can be creating, so many different purposes that can explain its existence, but you know, without having been there or finding corroborating evidence, it could be any one of those multiple things. Um, which is why, I, again, I went to the fish bones to, to even tell me more about, about the style of fishing that were being used. So um, hopefully, you know, in the future, um, looking at all the different fishing ranges that we've talked about here today, so all these, these good ideas that you guys are, are, are pointing out too, we can start looking at the uh, materials from the archaeological record with more of an informed view, right? Um, so maybe we've been missing things um, in, in our excavations, you know, not able to identify certain types of fishing gear because we're not thinking about it. You got to figure, like a lot of folks that dig archaeological sites on the coast, are not, you know, don't have 30, 40, 80 years experience fishing in saltwater scenarios, right? So, you know, having community members that have a background in fishing come help us work on archaeological sites is going to help us, and it's going to help us piece together these these questions that we have about the archaeological record. And archaeologists cannot know everything. We certainly not. We, not in any way ever, I mean, we're humans. We learn throughout our entire lives. We're never going to know everything. Um, so having multiple people come at these, these projects and problems is the best way that we're going to move forward with these questions, for sure.